Our next speaker is Joel Blanchard of Mount Sinai. Um, his talk is titled Investigating Mechanisms of Aging with Stem Cells, and he will be int introduced by his former mentor here, Lee Wei Tsai. Oh, sorry, I'm all tangled up here, sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, it is a great pleasure to introduce Joe Blanchard, um, who is a former postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. Um, so, you know, when I think about the legacy of my laboratory, I really think that it's the totality of the contributions made by every and each lab members. Um, and uh, Joe certainly um, has made very unique and important contributions um, to, the, um, uh, to the lab. Um, so um, my laboratory studies neurological disorder uh, with a particular focus on Alzheimer's disease. And more than um, a decade ago, uh, we realized that um, there are really uh, substantial uh, limitations to study uh, human diseases simply just using mouse models because um, it is very difficult um, for mouse models to develop some very human-specific uh, pathology and um, phenotypes. So, um, so we decided to adopt uh, the patient-derived um, pluripotent stem cell uh, system um, to, to study human diseases. And, um, and when Joe joined the lab, he really brought the system to a totally different level. Um, he, he was the first to, um, to uh, take a tissue engineering um, uh, approach um, to really create functional units of the brain on the dish, such as um, the cerebral vasculature on the dish, and further to use that to, um, to model um, um, pathology associated with aging and, and Alzheimer's disease. But then he further pushed the system to um, integrate all six different brain cell types to create a mini brain on a chip. Um, um, and we, we call it my brain, and you know, many people in the lab now uh, work with um, this particular system. And this really represents a microphysiological system that allows you not just um, to study the physiology of the brain, the pathology of the brain, but also to screen um, um, drugs. Um, and study drug properties. So, um, so I'm obviously very proud of his um, um, uh, accomplishment. And he joined um, uh, Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai uh, last year. And he's obviously multi-talented. And you know, he I guess he's a member of multiple different departments: neuroscience, developmental biology, regenerative medicine, and he's a member of different. Um, Institute. So, um, so today we're going to uh, listen to his new work uh, developed in his own laboratory. So, Joe. Thank you, Liwe, for the, the kind introductions. I'm really glad, happy to be back here today. Um, this might be biased, but I think some of the best science in the world is done at the Bacauer. And I think the talks that I've heard this morning really reaffirm from that attitude. Uh, when I signed my, my faculty offer, I was really actually pretty sad to leave the Bacauer, and I begged Liwe to let me stay as a postdoc. <laughs> she, she was kind enough to let me stay about a year and a half and then kicked me out, so. <laughs> um, Today I'm gonna to tell you about a new study that my lab's doing, trying to investigate aspects of aging in a, in a dish. And I think one of the strongest risk factors, as I'll mention, for, for all neurodegenerative diseases. Is it working? So one of the strongest risk factors for neurodegenerative disease is, is really aging. So can we study this in, in the laboratory in a dish? And we, I think we've, have some preliminary evidence um, that we've gathered that we can. And so the, the question my lab is really focused on is that the majority of us will live cognitively and, and um, neurologically healthy lives, but about one in 10 of us 
by the time we're 65 to 70 years of age, we'll experience neurological impairments. Um, and right now, this is, is a pretty big problem in the United States. There are about 5 million people with the most common form of neuro neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's disease, and the second most common, Parkinson's disease. There's about a million. And this is really a growing problem. We don't have drugs to treat either disease effectively. Um, so by the year 2050, it's estimated that, for example, Alzheimer's disease will grow to about 60, 16 million people. Um, and so my lab is really trying to understand what um, underlies, what mechanisms underlie this phenotypic divergence in aging. And there are a lot of clues that we have. Um, genetic studies have told us what genes are involved in certain forms of neurodegeneration. And recent advances in um, single-cell transcriptomics technology has been able to tell us in which cells certain genes are on and off and how they relate to particular um, neurodegenerative diseases. But we're still a long way from having diagnostics and, and um, therapeutics for uh, these diseases. And so what I've been, uh, let me grab that, trying to do is really accelerate this with uh, the, the in vitro stem cell technologies that Liwei mentioned. And really the, the goal here is to build human brain tissue in, in a dish where we can replay the events of neurodegeneration again and again and really understand at, at the cellular and molecular level what's going wrong. And we want to complement neuroimaging studies that are ongoing in the clinic and, and animal studies that are going on in the laboratory to really accelerate the path towards diagnostics and therapeutics for these, these terrible neurodegenerative diseases. And so while I was a, a postdoc at, at, here at the Picower, one example of, of this technology is we took patient-derived stem cells and we were able to differentiate them into three different cell types in the, the human brain. And, um, brain endothelial cells, pericytes, and astrocytes, and we encapsulated them in a hydrogel and allowed them to interact. And over a period of about four weeks, they self-assembled into what anatomically and, and functionally looked like the human uh, blood-brain barrier. And we've done a number of studies on this to, to, to um, qualify that. And we've used this technology to ask um, aspects about um, pathologies found in the Alzheimer's disease brain here on the, the left is an example of the mouse hippocampus, and there's a lot of amyloid building up in yellow along the, the vasculature. But these in vitro models allowed us to understand the mechanisms underlying this, identify drugs that, that reduce this pathology, and actually improve, improve learning and memory in the, these, um, these mice. And this work was a collaboration with Leila Kay, a grad student, and Taeyoon Kim, a postdoc in Liwei's lab. And so as I went out to start my own lab, I started thinking about could we extend this technology beyond just studying pathologies associated with disease and start to study aspects of aging in a disease. And one of the diseases we turn to is, is Parkinson's disease. As I mentioned, it's the second most common neurodegenerative disease. And what everybody studies in Parkinson's disease is the dopaminergic neuron death. And this is more, one of the most salient features, but there are a lot of other features of, of this disease. But what dopaminergic neuron death looks like, it actually happens in this region of the brain called the midbrain or substantia nigra. And you can see the, the dopaminergic neurons are actually pigmented. So in a healthy brain, there's a lot of dopaminergic neurons, but in a Parkinson's disease brain, there's a loss of dopaminergic neurons. And again, this is thought to be largely um, age-related disorder with an onset around 65 years of age. And we know the genetic causes of, of a lot of these um, age-related neuro uh, Parkinson's disease, and they're pointing us towards mechanisms such as mitochondrial stress, nuclear pathology, and, and lysosomal dysfunction. But what is lesser known and what is more rare is that there are actually juvenile forms of, of Parkinson's disease. And the, for example, in mutations in this gene called ATP13A2, they actually cause a, a rare juvenile um, form of Parkinson's disease that has movement impairments and, and cognitive impairments. It's very severe. And not a lot is known about what this gene does and why it causes Parkinson's disease. So we set out to try to understand why this gene that no one really knows much about is causing this early onset form of Parkinson's disease. And through this study, we hope to understand some fundamental processes about aging. And so fortunately, um, in, the, in this path, I had co-mentored our grad student, Lily, by, with Tim Affold. And she had developed a protocol for making these mini midbrains where the, the dopaminergic neurons live in, in the laboratory. And you can see there's a spinner flask here with hundreds of, of mini midbrains. 
in it. And so this is a scalable protocol that allows us to ask a lot of questions and screen for drugs that, that might intervene. And one of the, the nice features of this is I mentioned the, the, the midbrain, the dopaminergic neurons are pigmented, and you can see them here, but these mini midbrains that we're making actually become pigmented too, similar to the, the human midbrain. You can see the pigmentation here, and we've stained for dopaminergic neurons in these, these mini brains too, and you can see them on the, the far right there. And so what a talented postdoc in my lab actually did is took the stem cells that we're making these mini midbrains from, used CRISPR engineering to make a healthy copy of the ATP13A2 and a Parkinson's disease copy. And these stem cells are genetically identical except for this one thing. And we differentiated them into the mini midbrains. And what she observed is that in the, in the normal um, mini midbrain, you see a lot of dopaminergic neurons, but in the Parkinson's disease midbrain, you see not many dopaminergic neurons. I mean, this is just one example of it, but we've, we've done a lot of rigorous testing around this. And so working with a, a postdoc, in, another postdoc in the lab, Gustavo, what she actually did was ex develop a protocol for extracting the key cell types from these mini midbrains. Um, here's an example where she's extracting the, the astrocytes from the mini midbrains, and you can see they express midbrain astrocyte markers, NER1, and, and other astrocyte markers. And what this allowed her to do is really reconstruct the, the organoids in a tissue culture dish. And when she did this, she took the normal astrocytes with normal dopaminergic neurons. The neurons survived, similar to what we saw before when she took the, the PD astrocytes with the PD neurons, the neurons died. But she did an additional experiment where she co-cultured the normal astrocytes with the PD neurons, and the neurons survived, but then when she co-cultured the PD astrocytes with the, the normal neurons, the neurons died. And what this really said to us is that the mutations in ATP13A2 caused the astrocytes to become toxic to the dopaminergic neurons. And so if we could understand this more, we might be able to um, intervene. And so what Elena went on to do is to do RNA sequencing on, on the isogenic or genetically identical astrocytes. And um, she found a lot of genes were, were upregulating and through a lot of, um, rigorous computational analysis, just to make a, a long story short, what we found is that the, the ATP th mutations in ATP13A2 is actually driving astrocytes into an, a senescent inflammatory phenotype. And so what this means is that they're actually slowing down their ability to help cells and secreting bad molecules that, that could be potentially toxic. And we, we've um, assayed for a number of these molecules here showing uh, a technique called RT-PCR. PCR. So th this is where I should um, tell you a little bit about what ATP13A2 does. And so it was only, this was only discovered a couple of years ago by a collaborator of ours, Peter Vangaloo, who who's, we collaborate with, with through the um, Aligning Sciences Against Parkinson's Disease. And so normal ATP13A2 is actually what's called a polyamine transporter. And polyamines are these, these antioxidant molecules, spermidine and spermine. They're found outside your cell, and they br get brought into your cell through structures called endosomes and lysosomes. And in the lysosome, there is actually the ATP13A2 transporter. In the healthy cells, it pumps the, the polyamines out of the, the lysosomes. But in the P, the PD mutations actually break this pump. The ATP13A2 transporter is broken. And so what happens is that the polyamines get trapped inside the lysosome. And this is thought, uh, the prevailing hypothesis is that this induces mitochondrial stress. But what Elena hypothesized and, and has evidence for is that this actually causes endogenous or, or upregulation of polyamine synthesis inside the cell. And how the cell actually does this, and this is a known pathway that occurs under stress, is it uses these, this molecule as a substrate called s methionine, or SAM. And SAM gets, is converted through a long metabolic process into polyamines. But under normal circumstances, SAM doesn't do this. What SAM is really required for in, in the healthy cells is methylating DNA and methylating histones. And this is really important for controlling what genes are on, what genes are off, and protecting DNA from stresses like UV and, and other things. And so um, Elena hypothesized that because the cell is using SAM as a substrate for polyamine synthesis, that it actually downregulates its ability or removes its ability to use it to control gene expression and protect D D uh, G DNA. Sorry. Um, and so 
she hypothesized that there would be alterations to histone and DNA structures in, in these ATP13A2 mutant astrocytes. And so we, this is one of the more, I, I like this picture, it's not a very strong evidence, but what she's finding is that in the ATP13A2 to Parkinson's disease astrocytes, there's upregulation of, of, of different changes in histone marker expression here shown H3K trimethylation, and you can see a little bit more dots in these PD astrocytes compared to the, the, the normal astrocytes, and we've quantified it over a lot of different cells. We have different, different layers of evidence to suggest that there are really um, chromatin or epigenetic changes occurring because of this, this polyamine transporter. And so to test this hypothesis, we actually found, Elena actually found a drug that blocks the conversion of SAM into SAMDC, and it shuts down this process of converting SAM into polyamines. And so she hypothesized that if she did this, that it, it might rescue the, the, the inflammatory phenotypes see, that she's seeing in the astrocytes. And luckily, this, this actually works. So in, in normal astrocytes, we have low expression of, of these inflammatory markers here shown in the, in the blue. In the PD ATP13A2 astrocytes, we see upregulation of these inflammatory markers. But when we're giving them the PD astrocytes these drugs, we see a downregulation of these inflammatory markers to levels similar of those seen in the, the normal um, astrocytes. And so this is really encouraging evidence. I think that potentially these mutations in uh, ATP13A2 mutations in, in astrocytes could be altering the, the histone um, methylation and gene expression and leading to a senescent inflammatory phenotype that's toxic. And we've identified a way to, to block this process and, and promote healthy astrocytes. And so just to, to summarize, I, I think this could be a fundamental process of, of, of aging. Um, the, it's known as we age, there's a decrease in, in polyamines throughout our body and, and particularly in our brain. And our, as we age, the, our histones and, and um, DNA expression patterns change. And so we're, we're now investigating the hypothesis that these two things are actually linked. And some encouraging evidence in, in other model systems is that if you supplement in the diet polyamines such as spermidine and spermine, these actually improve health and lifespan in, in these organisms. And so we think this might be a way not only to improve health and lifespan, but by blocking polyamines in, in our culture systems to, to model aspects of aging. And so this is, I just want to thank all the people that have contributed to this work. So Elena has done a lot of the, the work with polyamine, with Gustavo and, and Lily. And this work was largely funded by the Aligning Sciences across Parkinson's Foundation and the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, and I think most of all, I, I, I want to thank the Pacauer and, and especially Leeway for all the, the mentorship. I think this experience that I had at the Pacauer was really transformative to my career and, and allowed me to hit the ground running when I, I started my independent lab and, and recruit funding and, and build a team that I think hopefully I can give back to the Pacauer you know, with the, the science that we do outside this building. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, uh, I think I'm going to turn it over to you to self-moderate there, just like with Ben, because I don't see any online questions. Um, does anyone have questions in the room? Yeah. Um, how, yeah how do you model getting the specificity of the cell death of the neurons with this specific mutation? Is it localized? Are these astrocytes localized to the brain? Or are the dopamine neurons specifically susceptible? Yeah, it's something we're exploring in, in this project and in, in another project. What we've, um, Gustavo, who's over here, he's actually been able to make, using iPS cells, astrocytes that are from different brain regions. And now we're asking the question whether only midbrain astrocytes are toxic to dopaminergic neurons, or, or can cortical astrocytes be? And I think it, it, they have, he's demonstrated that they have, like the midbrain dopamine or in the cortical astrocytes have different molecular profiles. And we've, we also have spinal cord. And so I think it's an exciting direction to see if we can mo model some of these regional differences in, in neurotoxicity and, and neurophenotypes. Awesome. Thank, you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? And, uh... All right, I think we're done. 
Um, thanks so much, uh, Joel. One, uh, that was one more question. Sorry, Pam. Oh, one more. Can you repeat it um, yeah, uh, just... before you answer it? Just, yeah. Sorry. Coming from a different country, I don't know if um, analytically um, this research just what you presented is just based on the United States, for example. Uh, is this just a study just for people that are facing in the United States affect different from other countries? I don't know if that is. Um, so there's, there's my question. Yeah. So the question is, does the research affect people worldwide? Yes. I, I yeah. think that the example that I just talked about, the mutation in ATP13A2, it's actually only, it, it's been found in a Jordanian family, so a family in Jordan, and it's, that's primarily the only place that, that it's been documented. And so I, I think we're, we're open to studying um, anything all the diseases across the whole world, I guess. So, <laughs> I think. Um, I do see one question coming in online. Um, uh, have you looked at lipids in the PD astrocytes? Yeah, <laughs> we have. That's a long story, but yeah, I think there's there's definitely a role for lipids in a lot of PD and in, in AD phenotypes or AD neurodegenerative um, processes. Okay, right. Thank you. going once, going twice. Um, <laughs> um, thanks so much, uh, Joel, I appreciate that.